Welcome to Built to Go, a van live podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time we're going to talk about which new van you should buy. What is the best van? As you uh, have expected, it is not as simple as that. We're also going to talk about a secret van that you may not have even ever heard of, a product review of bacon, which is pretty exciting. And we're going to talk about an incident that happened while I was driving home with my new ambulance, and uh, it was a little spooky. I'm just saying. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me once again. I super appreciate you being here, and I'm all tangled up. There. I'm now not tangled. That's much better. First shout out to Karen and Ken, both of you. Thank you very much for buying me a Sum Diesel. I'm going to have to change that. I think it's getting on my nerves. If you would like to support this show, please visit buymeacoffee.com slash built to go. That's two T's, not three, not one. That means no more ads for the podcast. And I'm sorry, YouTube folks, we're still going to have ads because that's how YouTube is. And a special shout out to Nick, who asked me about water cooling your bed. I'm still researching that. I will do that next week. So I promised you this week, it'll be next week. That's how it goes. So yeah, if you're interested in a weird way to cool your bed in your van without cooling the whole van, I'll talk about that next week. But this week, let's get on to the topic at hand, which is, which is the best van to buy? Now we're talking about new vans here, right? So somehow you have enough money to buy a new van and however you got that money is up to you. Maybe you saved it up over a long period of time. Maybe you had a rich relative die, you hit the lottery. I don't know, but you've got at least $45,000 to spend on a new van or much, much more. (laughs) And we're talking about an empty cargo van here. Your goal is to buy a brand new empty cargo van and then build it out to be your perfect van. Okay, I got you covered. First, we have to talk about what your options are until we can figure out which is the best van. So there are currently four vans that are produced and sold in the United States. And those are, in no particular order, the Chevy Express, aka GMC Savannah, same van, different nameplates, the Mercedes Sprinter, the Ford Transit, and the Ram Promaster. Now, a note on the Ram Promaster. Ram was spun off from Stellantis Corporation. Dodge Ram was a vehicle, but they took the Ram plate and spun it off as its own thing. So if you search for a Dodge Promaster, you'll find some hits, but that's not technically accurate anymore. They're not Dodges anymore, they're Rams. So if you're looking for a Promaster, search on Ram Promaster. And as for are they American vehicles? Hmm, That doesn't really mean so much anymore. Stellantis is an Italian company. The Ram Promaster is basically a Fiat. (laughs) It's a Fiat Ducato. But in the U.S. it has a different engine. In the U.S. it has basically a Jeep engine in it. Uh, It's a a very common engine that's found in a whole lot of Chrysler vehicles. So, uh, So yeah, that's the difference between a Ducato and a Promaster. But the body and everything is the same. Now you may say, but what about the Econo line? They still make Econo lines. Well, the Ford Econo line stopped being produced as a cargo van in 2014 and yet you see this brand new rv that's a ford econo line on the front how can that be that's because econo lines are still sold today and basically exactly the same as they were in 2014 but only as cutaways that is you can only buy the front of the van (laughs) you have to build the back of it yourself so they don't actually sell econo lines as cargo vans anymore only cutaways that you can turn into rvs or box trucks or flatbeds or or whatever you want that's it's kind of an amazing platform in that regard but we're going to dismiss it for this because you can't actually buy a ford econo line van and a note on the chevy expresses there this is the last couple of years they're going to stop making those chevy is going to make only electric vans in the future we don't know exactly what that's going to look like just yet but we will talk more about the chevy express because it is a platform that doesn't get enough talk in the van life community and it has one category in which it is the best And that's the point of this. The best doesn't mean anything. There is no the best. Everything is a compromise. You cannot have the van with the tallest roof, the widest platform, and the best off-road vehicle, the one that gets the best gas mileage. You have to optimize. So the very first step of figuring out which van you want is what's the most important thing to you. Make a list of things like, I want to be able to go off-road. 
I want to be able to sleep sideways in my van. I want to have as much space as possible. Or I want to be able to park in city parking lots. I want to be able to go through drive throughs which, believe me, if you have a high roof van, you quickly learn that that is not a thing you can do. And so on and so on. Make a list of the priorities you want from your van. And no matter what, you're going to have to compromise, but you can optimize your compromise, and that's what we're going to try to do today. Okay, so real quick rundown on these vans. The Chevy Express GMC Savannah is an old-school American big van. It hasn't changed much in years. It's just kind of a big van like you can imagine from the 80s or even 70s. And it's an old platform. It's been around forever. Pretty easy to get parts for, and they're fairly common. Not a very common build-out van. The Mercedes Sprinter, it was the van that relaunched the van life movement. It was the first van that was commercially produced with a high top in the U.S., and that was, that was the appeal. Until the Sprinter came over to the United States, you had to add a high top to any vehicle you wanted. The Sprinter was the first one you could just buy with a high top. And they're still made today. It's like the fourth version they have now that are available in the U.S. And yes, I have a Sprinter, but it is old, and we're not going to actually talk about my Sprinter <laughs> for the very first time. Then there's the Ford Transit. Now, Ford Transits, for folks who are not in the U.S., they've had Transits for years, but in the U.S., they're a fairly new platform you know 10 years old or so and they replaced the econo line as ford's van and um, they're just kind of a middle of the road van you'll see as we talk about the specs and everything they're just kind of in the middle of everything but they have two areas where they excel and i'll talk about that and then finally there's the promaster the ram promaster a very commonly built out van very commonly used by rv manufacturers and other professionals to build out vans and it has has a lot going for it and I've often said it is the best van for van builds but is it really well there are some places where it's absolutely the worst van for van builds and we're gonna talk about that what is your desire what matters the most to you let's say you just care about price I want a brand new van and I will make anything work all I care about is price well the cheapest one is going to be the Chevy Express that is the cheapest commercial van you can buy today followed by the Ram Promaster, which is the cheapest of the Eurovan styles. So that's it's as simple as that. Now, long-term cost of ownership is a different thing than buying the van. Cost of ownership for a Promaster is going to be a bit more than from a Ford Transit from what I've seen. So over the course of 10 years, you actually might spend more money on your Promaster than you would on your Ford Transit or your Chevy Express. So consider those things. Ease of ownership. How easy is it to own the vehicle? Meaning how few hassles are going to have? Sprinters, you know, uh, I talk a lot about the hassles of my Sprinter. Promasters also tend to have a lot of hassles. Chevy Express, you've got the hassle of having a pretty old style of vehicle and there's a lot of stuff you can't do with it that you can in the new vehicles. The vehicle that has the lowest hassle factor, in my opinion, and it's just an opinion, is the Ford Transit. And I base that largely on the fact that they're so common, there's so many of them, and there are so many places you can get service for them. Of all the vans there are out there, with the exception of the Chevy Express, the Ford Transit is the one that you can get service done almost everywhere. Almost every Ford dealer will service your Ford Transit, where that isn't true for Promasters and especially Sprinters. There are very few places that will work on Sprinters, even at Mercedes dealerships. And the same is true for Ram Promasters. Not every Chrysler dealer is going to accept a Ram Promaster. They'll send you to a specialized shop. And a lot of the little shops don't like them because they're weird. So something to consider. The tallest van, which is the tallest? So let's say you're somebody who's six six, and being somebody who's six foot zero, I completely understand the short privilege of van life. That's right, folks. If you're a little bit less than average height, van life is for you because you take up less space and you can fit in more vans. And good for you. For those of us a little taller than average, or even a lot taller than average, vans are a bit more problematic. And uh, that's why, if you're super tall and height is your most important thing, the Ford Transit wins by far. They have an 80-inch 
ceiling height in the tallest of the transits. Now they have three roof styles in the transits. They have a low roof, a mid roof, and a high roof. The mid roof, if you're six foot, you can probably get away with it. You're gonna be you know, tilting your head a little bit, but the high roof, just about everybody can fit in. And if that's your criteria, then there you go. You've picked your van, that, that's all there is to it. However, if you're really only concerned about being able to sleep sideways, so meaning that you want your bed to go sideways in the back and then maybe have a garage under it, which is a very efficient way to build out a van, the vehicle that does that the best is the Promaster, for two reasons, actually. Promasters are the widest vans you can get, and they're eight feet wide about. So me, being six foot, that's 72 inches, I could easily fit side to side in a ProMaster, even with the walls built out. For sprinters, if you notice the high-end sprinters that have side to side beds, they often have flares on the outside. And those flares are simply places to put your head and feet. <laughs> That's all they're for, because the vans are so much more narrow. Transits are the same in that regard as well. So you can choose tall or you can choose wide but you can't have both. Now, if it's cargo capacity that you're worried about, like what is the van with the most space? And we're not talking about box trucks here. We're just talking about regular old cargo vans. The clear winner by far, <laughs> by like a hundred cubic feet, is the Sprinter 170 inch wheelbase extended. That thing has an enormous amount of space in it. It's not the tallest, it's not the widest, but it is the longest. And you basically have your wheels spread really far apart. And then you've got a big butt on the thing, <laughs> which is gonna seriously take away from maneuverability, but is gonna give you a ton of space inside. So if you had maybe three people you were trying to fit into a van, that might be the way to go. So in short, the, the longest van is the Sprinter, the tallest is the Ford Transit, and the widest is the Ram Promaster. They all exceed each other in one of those specs. It's kind of weird. Middle of the road, mid-roof Ford Transit. Now, which is the easiest to build? Well, the Promaster is going to take that hands down, and the Chevy Express is probably going to be the worst. Ease of building is, is somewhat subjective, but if you're somebody who doesn't want to have to cut a lot of rounded angles, the Promasters are pretty square, and that makes them a lot easier to build out but you will find more accessories for the Sprinter. So if you want to buy pre-made accessories that fit in the van, you're going to find most of those with the Sprinter. You can find them for just about any van. The Chevy Expresses aren't built out very much, so there isn't all that much stuff for them. I mean, you can buy aluminum shelving and things like that, but you're never going to find a pre-built van life kit for a Chevy Express. Now here's the one a lot of you are thinking about, which is which is the best off road van. Now, I want to be very clear that no van is very good at off-road. I don't care what you do to it. It's still a van. And I posted a video a couple weeks ago about how people get stuck in their vans, even their super fancy four-wheel drive sprinters. So let me go down the list here. Ground clearance, Sprinter. Sprinter has the best ground clearance without anyone putting in lift kits, and that's a very important thing off-road. As far as four-wheel drive, and we could spend a whole episode talking about that, the Ford Transit has an all-wheel drive option, and the Sprinter has an option they call four-wheel drive, but it's technically an all-wheel drive solution. That's why I think the best vehicle for off-roading is the Chevy Express. And you might be saying, well, Jeff, that doesn't come in four-wheel drive. I was like, you're right, but it's exceedingly simple. It's a very simple platform. It's very easy to raise up, and they make four by four aftermarket kits that are true four by four. Case example, and I talk about this guy a lot. If you watch Foresty Foresty's videos, he's in a Chevy Express with an add-on four-wheel drive kit, and it is a beast. Plus, it's not a high top, which is something that is a negative thing for off-roading. So I know they sell these incredibly expensive sprinters as off-road rigs, and they look all tough, and there's stuff hanging all over them, and they've got moles, and, and oh my god, there's look at they've got those traction boards, and a winch, and, uh, and then they get off-road and they get stuck. I, that's just the way it is. The four-wheel drive systems in these are meant more for slippery roads than they are meant for off-road, and that is just a fact. Does that mean you can't off-road in these things? No. 
It means you have to be smart about it, and you can't go everywhere like you could in a Jeep Wrangler. Case in point, my NV200, which underneath was fairly similar to a Ram Promaster, which is the worst off-road vehicle of every, all of these. I was able to go everywhere I wanted. I went down dirt roads. I went up mountains. I drove through ghost towns in Nevada. I had no problem because I was smart about what I did. There's no adding four-wheel drive to either of those vehicles. They have this big bar between the back wheels that limits your ground clearance. There's nothing you can do about that. But, you know, think about it. If you're somebody who's going to live off-road and you want to do the most stuff, yeah, get a Chevy Express. If you want a high top and you want to go off-road, the most capable vehicle is the Sprinter. But do not think you've got a rugged off-road vehicle. You've got a rugged, maybe a few more options than the standard type of vehicle. Word to the wise. So which van is the best? Of all those ones I mentioned, which one is the best? It's completely up to you. In my opinion, the best van is the one that you own. That's the best van. And you can make it whatever you'd like. But if that van won't do something you really want to do, well, you can consider all the rest. Now, I have to give a shout out here to Flatline Van Co. Flatline Van Co. has an article that I'll link to in the show notes that goes through a lot of the things we talked about here. As I was doing research for this, I found this article that basically did most of my research for me. <laughs> so I want to give them a shout out. So it's Flatline Van Co. And they have a blog called Sprinter versus Transit versus Promaster that talks a lot about what we just covered. Tech Talk. Are you tired of talking about vans yet? Because I'm not. <laughs> We're 174 episodes in here, and here I go. As you know, if you've listened to the show at all, I used to have an NV200, and that's a compact cargo van, and they don't make those in the U.S. anymore. They're all gone. The Ford Transit Express, the NV200, the Promaster City, even the Dodge Caravan cargo version, all gone. None of them made in the U.S. anymore. There's a lot of complicated reasons why that is. A lot of it is politics. It's certainly not the market. Those vehicles were very popular. Because of this, I've often said that you can't buy them in the U.S. anymore, at least not new. And it turns out, while I'm right, I'm also wrong. Because there is a very specific vehicle that's still available in the U.S. that very, very few people talk about. And it's a cargo van, a regular cargo van, but it's shorter than a Toyota Sienna. It's shorter than a minivan. So what am I talking about? It's the Promaster 118. You may not have even ever heard of the Promaster 118. Promasters come in three wheelbases, not two. People are so familiar with the two that are thrown out there all the time because those are the most common for van building, they forget there's also a 118. And it's basically a compact cargo van. It's a very wide compact cargo van, but it fits in a city parking space. It basically does all the things that you would want a mini cargo van to do. So folks, if you miss your NV200 and you want something similar, yeah, the Ram Promaster 118 is out there, still for sale, and it might be the vehicle that fits that particular bill you're looking for. It has two drawbacks, unfortunately. One is the price. They start at about $43,000, whereas the next size up, which is a significantly bigger vehicle, starts at forty-six. dollars So you're paying a premium for having that little tiny vehicle. They're also fairly rare. They're a little bit hard to find, even in today's market where all vans are hard to find. But hey, I have to mention it. It exists, and in my opinion, it is the reigning champion, survivor, the only small cargo van available in the U.S. today. And uh, they're also kind of cute. Product review. Let's talk about bacon. Now, I'm sorry for those of you who are vegan and vegetarian and, and don't enjoy bacon. I have no arguments with you. I completely understand the ethical and health reasons for not eating bacon. Okay? That said, I love bacon. I think a lot of us love bacon. Bacon makes me happy. <laughs> if there's bacon involved in a meal, I'm just happier. I don't even care what the meal is. I'm just happy there's bacon. And so having bacon in my van is a happy making thing. It's a morale making thing. Let's say it's 40 degrees out and raining and everything's soggy in the van. And I'm just like, oh God, I miss my house, which is something that's going to happen. And then there's bacon. And then I feel much better. 
bacon is bacon is home it's comfort it's yummy it is the candy of meats as they say however cooking bacon in your van or even outside your van is kind of messy first off you have to refrigerate your bacon you understand this and second when you cook it it splatters everywhere i mean yeah you can use screens and then you have all this grease to deal with and it's just kind of a pain in the butt and then your van smells like bacon for a couple of weeks which is kind of okay in some cases <laughs> what if there was a better product a better bacon for your van yeah well you, you obviously figured out what i'm talking about here and that is pre-cooked bacon and lately i've been carrying a box of pre-cooked bacon with me in my van and with no plans i'll just when i go shopping i'll buy a box of pre-cooked bacon and stick it in the shelf of one of the cabinets in my van and i just leave it there and i love it I suddenly can finish a sandwich that was missing an ingredient, or I can just make some bacon and throw an egg in there and there's breakfast, or I can just have a snack. <laughs> I have bacon all the time, and it's so much easier to deal with than regular bacon. Now, when I was a kid in Boy Scouts, way back in the 80s, we used to buy canned bacon. It was something that we could buy at the grocery store in Massachusetts, where I grew up. And now it's become some weird gag gift that you can get on the internet for like $20 a can or something. So that's not really an option. But this pre-cooked bacon that comes in a little box, kind of looks like a regular box of bacon, and then a plastic bag, kind of like a regular bag of bacon, will sit on your shelf for years. And then when you cook it, you just have to heat it up and you can do that in a pan or in a microwave or in the sun. I mean, you can just leave it on your dashboard until it gets hot. And then there's no mess. It leaves a little bit of grease behind, but not something you have to pour out into a can. And then, you know, if you have leftover, you're supposed to refrigerate it after you open the package. But we know that in van life, those suggestions of refrigeration are, you know, they're just suggestions. And yeah, you can leave it on the shelf in your van for a few days without problems. At least I have. So consider the next time you're out buying bacon or the next time you want something in your van that's going to be shelf stable and will give you a pick me up when you need it. The pre-cooked bacon is pretty cool. I have a link to some in the show notes in case you can't find it in your grocery store. It is a little bit more expensive than regular bacon, but the convenience is worth it in my opinion. Tales from the road. I can't remember if I've told the story or not. I think I did in a video, but heck, I'm an old guy. I get to retell my stories. It's one of the prerogatives of living this long, okay? So when I picked up my ambulance, I bought it in Texas, and I had to drive it back to Chicago. But, um, you know, I mean, it's an ambulance, right? So I bought a new vehicle, so I took some time to play around with it. I went in the back, and there's, there was all kinds of stuff in there. Most of it's taken out now, but there was hoses and suction tubes and devices that I didn't understand and I just took a quick look at it all and I was like I'm gonna figure this all out later how do you start the thing <laughs> so I focused mostly on the front of the vehicle which also had all kinds of knobs and gadgets and that was it and I'm thinking all right you know as I, when I get home I'm gonna go through the whole thing and figure everything out which I did but on the way home I had a little bit of an experience. Now, if you follow any of the ambulance conversion forums, somebody will always ask, I don't know, uh, what if it's haunted? Now, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not big on the haunting thing. I, I'm not, uh, first off, I, I don't think ghosts are a thing. <laughs> and if they were, I wouldn't be afraid of them. Also, technically, no one has ever died in an ambulance because technically <laughs> you have to be declared dead by a doctor in the hospital. <laughs> At least that's what they say. Plus, think about all the people the ambulance helped. I mean, ambulances are things of good, not bad. Bad things have happened, but the ambulance is there to fix them. So all that bad juju stuff didn't really bother me. But when I started hearing voices <laughs> from the back of the ambulance while I was driving, well, I had to kind of take a step back and figure out what the heck was going on. I was literally driving down the road and I forget exactly what happened. I either hit a bump or went around a corner too fast as I'm still figuring out the vehicle. And I heard a thump. I, all right, whatever. I, there's going to be thumps. There's thumps all the time. That doesn't mean anything to me. But then I started hearing this very insistent voice. And it was saying things like, I mean, it's very, very insistent voice. 
very almost angry sounding and I, I didn't know what it was and I was like oh man did someone leave a radio in here because this van this ambulance had several radios in it at one time but I thought they had all been removed because they're all unlicensed channels that I am not licensed for but I thought wow a little bit of thunder here I thought that well maybe they had left a radio in it I mean after all it had the sirens and the lights so they had left some of the stuff in it but then it just kept repeating itself over and over again <laughs> radios don't do that i found a rest area and pulled over and i'm looking around the back and there's this kind of case on the floor and i was like okay that's what the bump was this case fell out and it's where the noise is coming from and it was this little black case with a little handle and it had this window, it was like a plastic window in it, and it was yellow with a bright red button. And I recognized what it was then. It was an AED. <laughs> you know, a defibrillator, the thing that you use when someone's having a heart attack, they left one in the van. And apparently when it fell off the shelf, it turned on, and this one has voice instructions <laughs> for what you're supposed to do. Like, attach paddles now. <laughs> press the red button now and it was trying to tell me how to shock somebody so that their heart would assume a normal sinus rhythm and uh i don't know how these things work and i know they give off a lot of electricity and i have this thing on the floor of my van yelling at me and i'm just want to turn it off <laughs> i just want to turn it off so i'm pressing the only button it has and it keeps giving me more instructions so i'm like oh what do i do and then what if I touch the wrong part or I press the button and it's going to actually shock me while I'm back there? So after probably five minutes of trying to figure this thing out, and, you know, these are made to be idiot-proof so that they, you, it'll walk you through shocking somebody. It's not meant to be idiot-proof in that it will teach you how to turn it off, or maybe that is idiot-proof. Finally, I found a way to unscrew it so I could take the battery out, <laughs> and it shut up. So it turns out my van is not haunted, at least not that I've been able to detect. There were voices coming from the back, this is true. And as for the AED, uh, I sold it on eBay because I didn't know what else to do with it. <laughs> wow, we're having quite a storm here. That's fun. A place to visit. Again, this is not a place that I have visited, but everybody I know who has visited this place has said it's wonderful and loved it and brought back merch and... Uh, yeah, it's the Spam Museum. Yes, they, they made a museum for Spam. Spam. Yeah, so Spam, if you're not familiar, and I'm surprised, it's not just email that you don't want. <laughs> spam is actually a potted meat product. It's, it's ham that's been processed and made to fit into a rectangular can. <laughs> And it's actually very popular around the world. I mean, in the U.S., it kind of gets made fun of. Not quite as much as it was in the U.K. with the famous Monty Python skit, which is what gave us the concept of spam as email we didn't want. But no, in Hawaii especially, spam is very popular. And they, they use it in poke and a whole bunch of other things. You can get spam tacos. Uh, in Boy Scouts, we used to eat fried spam. We would basically treat the spam as though it were bacon, which is appropriate because it's very fatty and very salty. But uh, it doesn't taste bad. Spam isn't bad. But they made a whole museum for it. <laughs> it's in Minnesota. And yes, I'll have a link in the show notes, but you go to this museum and there's this whole history of spam and they have all these dioramas of, you know, here was the first spam sold and whatever. And people love it. And this is in a part of the country where most of the activities are basically outdoors. Uh, Mall of America accepted. You go to Minnesota, you think lakes and woods and fun things like that. You don't think about going to museums, but heck, here's one you can go to. It's the Spam Museum, and even if you don't like Spam or you've never tried Spam, I think you'll like the museum, even though I haven't been there. So I'll have a link in the show notes. Just know that there's a Spam Museum in Minnesota, and, well, there's a Potato Museum in Idaho, too. Maybe I'll get to that one. Resource Recommendation. So we've talked a lot about new vans in this episode, but what about old vans? Like, let's say you've got a 20 or 30 year old van that runs fine, but you know, it's kind of dull looking. Maybe you repaired some rust spots and the paint doesn't match in places, or there's a big logo from some plumber on the side of it or whatever. Well, how can you economically paint your van? Because if you've looked at the commercial paint jobs or even wraps, 
it's going to cost you thousands of dollars. It's kind of amazing how much that stuff costs. So what can you do? Well, a lot of folks actually roller paint their vans. That's right. They use a roller brush, just like you would use on the walls of your house, and a bucket of Rust-Oleum. And after a minimal amount of prep, they just roll that paint right on. Now, I have a link in the show notes to this article about roller painting your van, and it's from axeladdict.com, and it, it walks you through the process. But the gist of it is, is that you want to use Rust-Oleum, which isn't just in spray cans. It also comes in gallon-sized buckets. You want to mix it up properly. You want to fix anything on your van that needs to be fixed, like any, you know, you want to bondo your areas or sand anything. You do all that. And then you mask off your taillights and things like that. You don't have to take them off. See, if you spray your van with a, a professional sprayer, there's overspray, and you kind of have to either really carefully mask things or take those things off. With roller paint, you have much, much more control. So you really only need to do masking tape around the edges of the windows and the trim and things like that, the door handles. And that takes a bit of time, but nowhere near as much as preparing for a spray. And then you use a gloss finish brush. That's what it's called. Every kind of roller brush has a different nap. You want the gloss finish nap. And the Rust-Oleum paint is kind of perfect because it does inhibit rust somewhat, and it also flows nicely, so it won't leave as many drips, and it'll kind of even itself out. Now, are you going to get a showroom finish with this technique? No. Are you going to get a van that is kind of consistent in color and looks like someone's taking care of it? Yes. In fact, the results of the roller painting look really nice, especially from a bit of a distance. Anybody looking up close is going to see the imperfections and stuff. But for a 20 to 30 year old van, I think that's fine. So I have the article in the show notes. It's axeladdict.com, and you can search on roller painting your van at that site, and it'll give you the entire walkthrough of what to do. And honestly, it doesn't look that bad. It looks like something you could do outside in a parking lot in a weekend. Well, folks, thank you very much for listening or watching to episode 174. As a reminder, this podcast is also available on YouTube. And for you YouTube watchers, this is also available as a podcast. <laughs> However you want to do it is fine with me. If you'd like to support the show, you can visit buymeacoffee slash built to go and buy me a some diesel. And that helps keep ads off the podcast and, and helps keep me not having to pay so much to produce all this stuff. <laughs> and I totally appreciate that. Music, as always, is by Simon and until next week, remember the words of Cami Garcia. Old things are better than new things because they've got stories in them. <laughs>